Today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jessica Tracy. She's a researcher of, and professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. That's Vancouver, Canada, not Vancouver, Washington. And she's the leading expert on the emotion of pride. I personally found her book absolutely fascinating. I think it'll be relevant to us here at Google and to people everywhere. Please give a warm welcome to Jessica Tracy. So today we're going to have a moderated question and answer as I prepared some questions for Dr. Tracy ahead of time and let her know what they are so she's not going to be surprised. I'll ask the questions and then after the questions we'll have an open audience session, open audience question and answer with a microphone right here and we'll have a book signing over on the table in the far corner. So why do we need two words for pride and what words do you suggest? And can you give examples of people showing both kinds? Yeah, so, um, so what we found, so pride, it's an interesting emotion in many ways that I hope we'll talk about. Um, and one of the most interesting things about it is we often think it's a bad thing, something that we shouldn't experience, right? It's sort of this sinful you know, emotion. It's considered to be a deadly sin in some religious views. Uh, it's egotism, it's arrogance. And in fact, what we found is that yes, that's part of pride, but it's not all that pride is. There actually are two different forms of pride. And we use the same word to describe them in English. We don't have two different words. Interestingly, in some languages, that's not the case. There are two different words for these two different things. But in English, they're not. Um, and so we need to make a distinction between the kind of pride that's, I would say, the bad pride. That's sort of, we call it, um, we call it hubristic pride. And we use that word hubristic because that comes from the Greek's word hubris, which basically means uh, someone who, I think in the Greek, in the Greek understanding, it was someone who kind of thought that he was more godlike than human. Uh, the classic example in, in Greek literature is uh, Icarus, whose father built him wings and then he used them to fly too close to the sun and died. Um, and that's the classic example of hubristic pride, someone who thinks they're so great um, and, and theoretically has a downfall as a, as a result of that. And, and I think, you know, psychologically speaking, there are, there are real negatives to hubristic pride. People who feel this hubristic pride, this sense of superiority over others, do have many problems, and typically those problems result from the fact that they think they're better than others and they use others in order to boost themselves up. So often they will put others down in order to feel good about themselves. This causes them to be not very likable, right? And so people who have a lot of hubris tend to be disliked, you know, they're antisocial, they're often aggressive, they're manipulative, um, and they have real relationship problems. But then there's this other kind of pride, and this other kind of pride is really. I'd say it's the sense of confidence that we take from a hard-earned accomplishment, right? It's, it's what we feel when we're achieving, when we're working hard, when we're being creative, when we're being innovative, and it's what motivates us to put in the hard work to create great things, to do great things. And that kind of pride is really a good thing, right? And, and, and what I argue in this book is that it's the thing that makes us want to do all the amazing things that we've done as individuals and as a species. It's what makes us want to achieve and, and be great. Um, the term that we've come up for that pride is authentic pride. And the reason that we use that word is because it makes a nice distinction, I think, between hubristic, with hubristic pride. Authentic pride is based on an authentic or genuine sense of self. And we feel it when we make a realistic appraisal of ourselves. when we kind of look at who we really are, how we're doing, what we're achieving, think about what we want, and, and see ourselves in a realistic manner. That's authentic pride. Hubristic pride, in contrast, is based on a more grandiose and inflated sense of self, so inauthentic. So that's why we use the term authentic, is it's kind of a nice contrast and it points out this key distinction. Thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is the message of your book in a nutshell? <laughs> um, so I would say my book has three messages. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you three nutshells, or three nuts. Um, the, however you might wanna think of it. The first is that pride is part of human nature. Um, and, and this, I think, is something that maybe some people would know already, but other people, I think, assume no. You know, we feel pride and we care a lot about pride in the U.S. and Western cultures because we're an individualistic society that's all about self-enhancement and boosting ourselves up, so pride makes sense. But in cultures where that's not so important, collectivistic cultures, more egalitarian societies, they probably don't have pride. And that's not what we found. In fact, what we found is that it is a human universal. Um, we, we've looked at the nonverbal display of pride, and it ex seems to exist everywhere we look. We've done studies in Burkina Faso, West Africa, people there in small-scale traditional societies who've never, um, never been exposed to American, American culture in any way, they identify pride in the same way that Americans do. So things like that are good evidence that it is part of human nature. So that, that's nutshell one. Nutshell two is 
the reason that it's part of human nature is because we evolved to experience pride because it's adaptive, which means it serves an important function in human lives. It does something useful for us. And what that is, is, as I was mentioning, it's what motivates us to work hard, right? Evolution made it so that we care deeply about our sense of self. We care how we see ourselves and how others see us. This is incredibly important to us. Pride is what we feel when we're basically doing a good job of building a sense of self that, that we like, right? That is the kind of identity we want to be. And this is really adaptive because the kind of identity that we're seeking typically is the kind of identity that our society wants us to seek. So it's a way of making sure, essentially, that we do what we need to do to make sure that we're staying included within our groups and eventually attaining status in those groups, that we're basically becoming the kind of person that others look up to, and that's really adaptive. And then the third nutshell is what we were talking about before, that pride is not just one thing, that there is this authentic pride that motivates creativity, achievement, innovation, but there's this other kind of pride as well, hubristic pride. And I think both prides are part of human nature. They both actually help us get status. People who feel hubristic pride do get power over others, but it's a different kind of power. It's not based on achievements and accomplishments and prestige. It's based more on taking control, uh, using one's arrogance and aggression to, to get one's way, and basically attaining dominance. So those, those are the three nuts, I would say, of the book. OK. So what was it like in Burkina Faso? And how'd you get like a trip funded by a university <laughs> research budget? It sounds expensive with all that air travel. You'd need translators because these people wouldn't speak English. Right. You'd have to bring computers out into the fields. And also tell us what it is you discovered about Pride on that trip. You alluded to it a little bit, but yeah. I'd like you to go into more detail. Yeah, no, totally. Um, it was not all that expensive, it turns out. Um, we did have air flights, I think, was the most expensive part of it, getting all the way to Burkina Faso, uh, which is in West Africa. But, um, you know, other than that, it's actually, you know, as, as a developing nation, it's a fairly inexpensive place to, to visit. The hotels, you can get, I mean, a really nice hotel, the nicest they have there, for, for quite cheap. So that part wasn't bad. And, and we were able to get a, a small grant from UC Davis, where I was in grad school, that funded this trip for me and my advisor and, and two other people who came with us. Um, and, you know, yeah, we, we, we actually didn't bring computers. It's funny you say that. We, we uh, yeah, it was interesting. This was back in 2003, which is probably the last time I traveled for three weeks with no, no computer at all, but we thought it would be too difficult to travel in Africa with a computer. So we had no computers. We did the study with paper. Imagine that. Um, you know, and we actually, we, we brought photos in. What we wanted to figure out was we had found in California that there's this pride expression. Um, and, and that it basically what it, it, what it looks like is, you know, I think you probably all know what it looks like, but it's essentially expansive chest, pulling your shoulders back, tilting your head up a bit, smiling slightly. And we'd found that people in California recognize this as pride. They all reliably said, if you ask them what emotion is this, they would say, yeah, that, that's pride. And, and almost everyone would agree that's pride. And that's meaningful because it tells us there's something objective and behavioral and real about this emotion, that it's not just this idea that's in our head, there's something we can see. But we wanted to go beyond that and say, well, maybe you know, it's just something that people in California know, that you know, it's a gesture that college students are familiar with. We wanted to know, is it actually universal? Is it part of human nature? And Burkina Faso was a great way to do that because Burkina Faso is an extremely poor country. At the time we did this research, it was actually the third poorest nation in the world. I think that's still roughly the case. And so as a result of the poverty that exists there, the people who live there really have no way of accessing information from other cultures. And, and that's true even of the people in urban areas, but we traveled to a rural part of the country out in the western countryside, um, and we were able, with the help of a collaborator, um, and this was someone actually who'd, who had, he was a village chief, or his family had been a village chief, and so because of that he was a government official, and he'd spent some time traveling in California. And that's how we connected with him, through people that he'd met when he was in California. But he still, he lives in Burkina Faso, or he lived in Burkina Faso at the time, and had many ties to this village where his family had kind of been the chief, chiefdom family basically for many years. Um, and so he was able to connect us with them. So we went to this teeny village. And the people there, I mean, really, it just it was an amazing experience, right? We go to this village, and it's just it's as if we're going back in time several hundred years, right? I mean, there's nothing. We, we got a ride in on a bus, and that was kind of the most modern thing that I saw any time we were there. Everyone who lived there lived in these mud huts. There's obviously, there's no electricity, no plumbing. There's kind of just chickens roaming around everywhere. Um, it was an amazing thing to see, kind of like the kind of thing you'd see in National Geographic. I think it's the kind of thing anthropologists see on a regular basis. But as a psychologist who does almost all of my research in a lab at a university with undergrads, this isn't the kind of thing I typically experience. So it was just, it was incredible. Um, and we were able, with his help, to find a group of 40 people who reported to us that they 
They couldn't read or write. Um, and, and I should say the national language in Burkina Faso is French, um, but very few people in the country actually speak French. It's, I think, um, I, I forget what the portion, proportion is, but most people just haven't gone to school, so haven't learned French. So they speak a local dialect. And all of our participants were, were, this, were these kind of people who'd never been to school, had never learned to read or write in French, and spoke only their local dialect, which didn't have a written form. Um, and so the nice thing about that is these are people who, they don't have any access to magazines or, or movies or film from, from the West, right? There's really, it's hard to think of how they might have somehow been exposed to an American pride expression or even a European pride expression, right? Because they're not seeing any kind of media from these other cultures. And that's really important because that allows us to say, okay, if these people recognize pride expressions in the same way that Americans do, it's not going to be because they've seen it, you know, they've seen some American showing pride. There's almost no tourist industry there at all. It's because this is something all humans know, right? That's, that's kind of really the only reasonable explanation. And so that's exactly what we did. We showed them photos. We brought a binder of laminated photos um, of people posing pride expressions as well, as well as other emotion expressions. And we asked them to identify them. And sure enough, um, most people in this sample agreed that the pride expression was in fact pride, which to me is really compelling evidence that there's something universal about this. Cool. So tell us about the Obama speech about taking down bin Laden and the Trump <laughs> speech right before it about birth certificates and what they showed and how that relates to pride. <laughs> yeah, so um, I use this in the book as an example of this distinction between hubristic and authentic pride and the kinds of leadership that each promote, because these are two people who are both leaders. At the time I wrote the book, I should say Obama was president. Um, Trump was not a presidential nominee at all. I think when I actually used that segment, he wasn't even considering running for president. So I was more referring to him as, as a leader in business. Um, it's interesting how that's changed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, so basically Obama made this speech, um, which some of you might remember when uh, Osama bin Laden was assassinated. Um, and it was a really important moment in his career. It was his first term of presidency. He hadn't accomplished all that much at that point, so the reviews of him as a president were not at all in. Um, this was his big accomplishment to that date. And so it was a really important event for him to basically use as a way of boosting his status, as a way of kind of promoting himself and showing, look, I'm doing important things as president. Um, and that's you know, something that all leaders have to do. And so the way that he talked about it, I think, is really interesting. Um, and if you go back and watch the speech or read a transcript of it, what you'll see is he talks about specific things that he did to make this happen. He uses the word I a lot, so he's referring to himself, which is really important because he needs to get credit. He needs to make it clear, I'm the president who did this. But he uses things like did, right? Words, words that express action. Here's what we did. Here are the specific steps that I took. And he really walks the audience through those steps, how the knowledge came in, what he did next. The other thing he does is he makes sure to talk about all the other people who were involved in this. And there were a lot of people, obviously, in the military, his advisors, um, the American people. And he gives credit to all these people. These are all examples of what you should do if you want to convey pride that's the authentic variety, right? Taking credit, that's an important thing because you need to, the feeling the pride is important, but talking about specific behaviors. So here's why I deserve to feel good. I'm not just telling you I'm the best, I'm the greatest, like some people do. I'm actually telling you here are the things I did to make this, to make this happen, right? So it's based on specific behaviors and crediting others. That's really important because authentic pride involves a sense of empathy and care for others. And it's really largely about relationships. When we feel authentic pride, we, take, we feel good about ourselves, but we also have a sense that others are, are good too. And we're able to acknowledge others and, and their role in helping us get what we want. And that's really important. It also helps convey a sense of humility, which often goes along with authentic pride. So I thought that speech was a great example of someone who really, you know, very tactically and I'm sure strategically used pride in a way to get a status bump, and which he did. He, he really rose in status after that event. Um, now, the, the contrasting example I give in the book, and, and there are really many that we could choose at this point, but the, the example I give is something that happened right around the same time as the Osama bin Laden assassination, which is that Donald Trump called a press conference. Now, at this point, he was just a citizen. He wasn't a politician. But he called a press conference because um, he wanted to announce something that he was very proud of. And he said, I am very proud of myself for this. And what it was was that Obama had released a long-form birth certificate proving once and for all we thought at the time um, that he is, in fact, an American citizen, or uh, was born in the US. Um, and the way that Trump talked about this accomplishment just is a really stark contrast to the way that Obama talked about his accomplishment. Um, because Trump, you know, Obama actually never used the word proud, which I think is important, because if you say, I'm proud of myself, 
it's it's a complicated thing to say. I think you know it can it can reek of hubristic pride. It doesn't have to, but I think we are sensitive to that to that word. Trump comes right out and says, "I'm very proud of myself because I you know for this great thing I did." Trump also says, "I did something that no one else could possibly do." So where Obama's crediting lots of people and saying, "Look, here are all the people who allowed this to happen," Trump is actually crediting no one and explicitly saying, "In fact, not only did no one help me with this." No one else possibly could have done this, which is just sort of a, you know extreme grandiosity. So I think it's a nice example of these two different kinds of pride, which end up playing out in two different styles of leadership that the two individuals have. So you talk about prestige and how it goes with authentic pride and dominance and how it goes with hubristic pride. Tell us a little bit about the difference between prestige and dominance as ways of influencing others. Yeah, no, that's that's a great segue because that's kind of exactly. The point that I was trying to make with the Obama and Trump distinction. Um, yeah, so we found that there are two different kinds of status, two different strategies toward getting status, which result in two different kinds of status. Um, the first we call prestige. And this is a status that's based on accomplishments, uh, earned respect, and being nice. So prestigious leaders are the leaders who have done a lot, they've done great things. Others look up to them and give them power because they know that doing so will benefit the group, both because these are people who will achieve things for the group and because these are skilled people who have something to teach. Right? So the reason that we follow prestigious leaders is because we want to learn from them. They have something of value, and they're either going to directly teach it to us, or they're going to let us copy them in some way. And so the interpersonal aspect of this is really important, that prestigious leaders are nice, they're agreeable, they're willing to help others, they want to help others learn. Dominant leadership, in, in contrast, is not about being competent or smart or, or contributing something of value to the group or being respected. It's about having power over something. Typically, dominant leaders are people who wield control over some resource, and it might be wealth. Um, you can think of this in our non-human primate ancestors as strength, right? Just, I'm bigger and stronger than you. And they know they have that power over others, and they wield control over it in an aggressive and manipulative way. And so what happens is they force people to follow them. They force followers to give them the power they want. Um, and followers do, but not because they want to, not because they like this individual. Typically, they don't like him or her, but they feel they have no choice. So you can think of the boss who, who threatens to fire her employees every time they question her mandates, right? This is someone who gets power not because employees look up to her, but because they literally feel, I have no choice but to give you power because, you know, otherwise I'm going to lose my job. And there are lots of leaders who use the strategy. Um, you know, uh, I think Steve Jobs is actually an interesting example of this based on many reports. He used to tell his employees things like, if we fail, it will be because of you. Right? That's a really threatening thing to say to someone who's depending on you for, for their livelihood. And what it did, I'm sure, was tell all of his employees, I better do what this guy says or else. Um, and that's, that's how dominant works. People sort of follow them because they feel that you know, otherwise there will be serious uh, punitive consequences for them. So there's a thing called a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Carol S. Dweck talks about it in her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success. In the growth mindset, you worked hard, might be what you tell your kid. The people try to grow and they're focused on getting better. With a fixed mindset, you might tell your kid, you are so smart. People value themselves as intrinsically smart. It seems very similar to me to your descriptions of authentic and hubistic pride. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of overlap there. Um, I think that, you know, as you pointed out, authentic pride, it really is linked to the growth mindset because we feel authentic pride when we think about what we can do to become better. Um, often we, we choose to do things because we think it will make us feel authentic pride and because we're actually feeling that we lack authentic pride, so we want to grow. Um, we actually have a, a study we did that I think demonstrates this nicely where we just, we looked at undergrads' performance on an exam, a real class exam and we asked them to tell us how they felt about their performance. And we wanted to see whether the people who felt pride in their performance would go on and perform better on the next exam because we thought, oh, pride's gonna be motivating, they're gonna, they're gonna do really well, and then they're gonna wanna do, do well again in the future. That's not exactly what we found. The people who did well did feel a lot of authentic pride, and they ended up doing well again on the next exam, but their authentic pride wasn't really what made them do well. For the, these were the high achievers, people who work hard all the time, so authentic pride isn't all that relevant to sort of changing their behavior, and, and they don't need to change their behavior. But what was really interesting is that some of the people who did poorly on that exam, they actually told us that they felt a lack of authentic pride. They were missing feeling authentic pride. And that lack of authentic pride, we found when we asked them a few weeks later, that made them want to say, I'm going to study differently for the next exam. I'm going to put in more hours next time. And when we looked at their performance on the next exam, those people, the ones who did badly on the first exam and then said, I'm missing authentic pride, 
they were the ones who ended up doing better on that subsequent exam. And we can trace their improved performance directly to that lack of authentic pride. So this is nice evidence that a desire for authentic pride is actually what motivates us to put in the hard work that we need to put in in order to do better, to perform at a higher level. Um, and that, I think, is growth mindset. And then, yeah, I think, as you pointed out, the, the other kind of mindset, I, I forget, a fixed mindset? A, a fixed mindset. Yeah, she often talks about entity theories and, and fixed mindset and performance goals. And all these things are linked to hubristic pride, right? Where instead of focusing on what can I do to achieve, what next you know, work do I need to do to become the kind of person that I want to that I want to be? It's much more of a focus on, I'm just great. How can I stay great? And and often then you avoid challenging yourself, right? Because you can think about this: if you feel great about yourself and you're worried about, you know, I don't want to I don't want to risk not feeling great about myself. That that's kind of scary. The last thing you want to do is is try to put in hard work again to achieve again, right? Instead, you you are instead focused on how can I enhance these great feelings that I have about myself right now, and that's yeah counterproductive. So. So what is cumulative cultural evolution and why is it important? How does pride fit in with it? Yeah, so this is a really complicated question. Um, and, I, and I'll just say this is kind of like the topic of an entire chapter in, in the book. So um, I'll, give a, I'll give a brief overview. But if, if you're actually curious about this, read chapter six. Um, that's my advice. But, but basically, cumulative cultural evolution is the process whereby all of a culture's um, creations. And that includes things like belief systems, values, religious ideologies, art, science, math, everything we create, technology, all of that builds upon itself over time and progresses. And the result is everything that we use pretty much in our day-to-day -day lives now, and this is true for us and people in every culture in, in human societies, all those things are things that could never have been created by one individual alone or even one community of people alone because what we have is the benefit of communities of people, societies of people creating ideas and then the smart ideas, the ones that are useful, sticking around, getting passed on to the next generation and then in that generation, one person maybe innovating, finding a way to do that even better. And the best ideas, the best innovations, are the ones that then spread throughout that community and get passed on. So what you end up with is a community where now we have things like Google Watches and, and, and phones that you know thousands of years ago could never have existed. And if you came along today and started from where we were thousands of years ago, you couldn't come up with something like that. But everything's building upon itself, essentially. In terms of where pride comes into this, um, Basically, cumulative cultural evolution, which explains you know, much of the way that humans are and, and other animals aren't, it's really kind of the best explanation for why we're different from other species, I think. Um, and it requires several different psychological adaptations, each of which I think is partly dependent on pride. So one thing it requires is a desire to innovate. Right? You have to learn something well, but then you have to say, I'm going to make it even better. You, know, you can think of this in small-scale traditional societies, the knowledge of how to build a very basic level canoe. That gets passed on. But then someone thinks, hey, you know, I want to make this canoe even better. Right? And this is a terrible example for me to give because I don't know how to make a canoe better, but someone, someone did in that culture, right? I'm going to make it out of fiberglass instead of wood or whatever it is. And that is really important because that's the advance that then gets the cultural concept to the next step. But in order to desire to make that advance, you need to have a motivation. You need to feel like, I'm going to do things that make a difference, right? I'm going to do something that isn't just accepting what I have, what we have, but actually taking it to the next level. And that's something that humans do that really no other animal does, right? That when things are good enough, when we're surviving, when we're getting by, that, that old canoe works perfectly well, we don't just say, hey, I'm fine. I'm surviving and reproducing. That's really all I need. We want more. And that's because we want to feel good about ourselves. And that's pride. So that's step one. Step two is teaching others what you know, right? Because cumulative cultural evolution requires on, uh, uh, depends on social learning. We have to spread the knowledge that we know. And th that means being prestigious. Like I said, prestigious leaders are the ones who are willing to teach others what they know. They're also the ones who tend to know the best stuff. So these are exactly the people that we would want to be spreading our highest knowledge, basically, throughout a society. Um, and that's prestige is attained through authentic pride, because that's what makes people prestigious and makes them want to share what they know with others. And then the last piece of it is learning, right? In order to really master a skill, to master or learn a piece of knowledge, you have to figure out who to learn from. You can't just sort of copy or learn from people indiscriminately, because if so, you'll get some bad information as well as good information. And so the, what you need to do is figure out <coughs> who the prestigious leaders are. And it turns out pride is really relevant to this, because people who feel prestige and who are prestigious show the pride expression. 
we've actually found that when people are seeking knowledge, when they need to learn something, they will choose to do that from someone who shows pride more than from someone who shows any other emotion expression. If given the choice, <coughs> they'll copy the knowledge displayed by someone who's expressing pride, suggesting that pride basically is a signal of someone's prestige and expertise. <coughs> so what does this pride expression look like? Could you show us? You've described it, but I'd like to actually see it. I know, I know. This is why I was saying I should bring slides, but we decided not to. Um, yeah, so I, I, mean, I can do a little version. It's basically putting, you know, you, you tilt out your shoulders, you push your chest out, you can stand kind of, you know, in a posture like this, tilt your head up a little bit. Um, sometimes you raise your arms above your head. That's kind of the like excited, you know, woohoo, pride. Um, but that's not necessary. We do find typically that arms are expanded from the body in one way or another, extended from the body. There is this general expansiveness. That, that's kind of the key part. But the most important components are expansive chest, um, posture, and, and head tilt upward. Those are kind of the key, the key aspects of it. OK, so what does religion tell us about pride? And what does Aristotle tell us about pride? And do you agree with their approaches? Yeah, so religious views, or various religions have talked about pride for, I guess, millennia at this point. Um, and typically, the view is that pride is bad, right? This is the sinful view of pride and lots of different, mostly Judeo-Christian. But even Buddhism talks about pride as, as something that prevents us from reaching nirvana. So lots of religions have really problematized pride. I think that's because what they're talking about is hubristic pride, right? They're talking about the kind of pride that makes us arrogant and egotistical. And you know, in religions, the goal is to teach people that someone or something, you know, God or, or the religious leader, is greater than them. So if you're feeling hubristic pride and you think you're the greatest around, that's going to be a real problem for religious ideologies. Um, interestingly, there are hints of a more nuanced view of pride if you look far back in history. And Aristotle is actually a good example of that. He's one of the few early thinkers who said, well, wait a minute. Pride doesn't have to be bad. And he said, actually, you know, what's bad is if you're great and you pretend you're not, that's not good, right? That's sort of lying. That's deception. In fact, a great man is someone who knows he's great and acknowledges it and is able to say, you know, yeah, I have these skills. And to me, that's sort of authentic pride, right? That this realistic appraisal of your own greatness and a willingness to acknowledge it, that can be OK. Um, and, and so that, I think, is sort of picking up on the distinction between authentic and hubristic pride. Yeah. So here at Google, we have something called Googliness, which is basically being the kind of people you want for a coworker. It's really important to our company culture. But how does pride fit in with being humble, not boasting, and helping your coworkers to be better? Yeah, no, I think this is a big issue, right? And I think um, often the solution that people come up with is, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna show pride, I'm not gonna feel any pride, I'm gonna pretend if I do something great, I'm not gonna talk about it, you know? And I think it's very, very tricky because authentic pride is a good thing. You know, I think it's the reason that all of us want to do great things, right? It's, you know, if you wanna develop something new or create something new, it's because you wanna feel good about yourself, you know, at, at some level. Once you get into it, once you get working, you might just get, you know, in the mindset where you're in the zone and you're doing your thing and you're not thinking about yourself. But, you know, what I would argue is the reason you originally decided to take this job to become the kind of person who has the opportunity to get in that zone is because of a desire to feel pride. At the same time, you don't want to be a jerk, right? You don't want to be that arrogant person that everyone kind of is avoiding at lunch. Um, and that's hubristic pride. So it really is this balance between going for authentic pride, acknowledging it, wanting to feel that, and avoiding hubris, avoiding bragging, right? Try not to talk about your successes to people who haven't had so many successes, right? You don't want to be that person. I mean, that's one obvious thing. Um, but really, it depends on the social norms of, of the group. And, and they vary dramatically from group to group, right? You guys probably know far better than me what the norms are here at Google. Um, but they really do vary from culture to culture, because clearly, you know, there's a culture in which Donald Trump is doing amazingly well, where it's perfectly acceptable and even valued to go around telling everyone that you're the greatest, you're the smartest, you know, you're the best in all these ways. I think most of us in the culture that I live in, uh, certainly in Canada, feel like that's not really OK. Even if you think it's true, that's not something you should say. And there are cultures that are even more extreme in that way. You know, If you go to um, Kalahari Bushman, which is a really egalitarian society, it's not OK to talk about any success ever. right? And there's stories, anthropologists tell stories about people in that culture where if they have a success, say they have a big kill in a hunt, when they come back, the last thing they do is bring it up, right? Instead, they kind of will go, uh, the, this, he talked about this one hunter who had a success and, and went and sat by himself and waited until someone approached him. And then finally, when someone approached him and said, how did you do today? He said, oh, you know, not, nothing much happened. It wasn't, it wasn't really a big day. 
And that's what actually tells his friend, oh, something good happened, right? Because he's following this <laughs> intricate set of you know, norms about how we talk about our success while retaining this egalitarian structure of the society. And in fact, what, what uh, people told the anthropologists who reported this is, we have to require people to do this. If we let them talk about their success in any way, if we let them show pride, they would get too big, and that would be a real problem. And, and, it, and he, what he told the anthropologists is, eventually their pride would kill them. So this is a way of protecting everyone. So it really is about different norms and different cultures about when it's okay and how it's okay to talk about our pride. So how do programmers who are trained to be humble authentically get prestige? We're trained to care about doing the right thing more so than about raising our own status. Yeah, and I think that's okay. And in fact, I think that's that's a great thing. You know, I think um, thinking about doing the right thing, whether that's you know building a new product that's great or caring about your coworkers, those are things that you can take pride in. And you know, what I would say is, it's actually good to think about those things. What kind of Googler, what kind of you know worker do I want to be? What kind of person do I want to be? And then think about what you need to do that. Don't think about how do I get high status? Because what we found is that the ultimate evolutionary function of pride is to get you status, but that's not the proximal function. And so we make this distinction between the psychological motivations that are happening in our head, the proximal functions, and ultimate functions. Ultimate functions are why we as a species do these things, and they're the ultimate benefits. But the idea is, if we do these things for proximal reasons, like I want to feel good about myself, that's enough of a proximal reason to do it. That gets you to do the behaviors. The ultimate outcome is you're going to get high status. But you don't have to worry about that. Evolution has made it so that that will be the outcome of you just doing the stuff that you want to do because you want to feel good about yourself. So a long time ago, I read a uh, comic strip called Bloom County. <laughs> and as I remember, I'm not sure my memory is completely valid on this, they started criticizing a number of different political figures. And there was one political figure that they criticized who then bought King Features Syndicate that Bloom County was a part of and canceled the strip. <laughs> um, are you afraid that same uh, political figure, a uh, person who's now a political figure, might do that to your book because your book talks about it? Um, you know, I'm not particularly scared of Trump. Um, I think, but you know, I think many people are, I will say. I think that um, he uses tactics of fear and intimidation really effectively, which is what dominant leaders do. That's how they get power. Um, what I noticed watching kind of the primary season was that that is a large part of how he won the primary election is he essentially intimidated anyone on the Republican side who wanted to raise questions against him. He did this in various ways. I think he, you know, he used Twitter campaigns to hurt people's reputations if they were going to say bad things about him. He insulted his opponents in, in the various debates. And so all this had the effect of making people afraid of him, partly because they were, or largely I would say, because they were afraid of what he was doing to their reputation among Republican voters. So if you care about you know, his followers and what they think of you, you're not going to mess with him. Right, because he really has that power, and so that's that's a very strategic kind of move. Um, for people who don't care what his followers think of them, which I think is where Hillary Clinton kind of stands, you don't have to be afraid of him because what what power you know does he have really over over people other than the people who really care for him? So, yeah. All right, thanks. We're going to open it up for audience questions now. So the mic is right over here. Feel free to come on up and ask a question. What is the difference between uh, self-confidence and pride? And is there anything that you talked about pride today that doesn't really apply to self-confidence? That's a great question. Um, so I would say that uh, they're very similar. Authentic pride, I would say, is very much a sense of self-confidence. Um, typically, we think of self-confidence more as a disposition, so a trait um, that some people have and some people don't, or some people have a lot and some people have less of. And authentic pride, we can think of more as a momentary state um, for the most part, although we can be dispositionally authentically proud. If you're dispositionally authentically proud, I would say that's much the same as having a strong sense of self-confidence. But what I think is important is the way that we use these terms. Sometimes when we talk about self-confidence, we don't distinguish between what I would call the authentic kind of pride and more narcissistic confidence. So some people who are self-confident are also narcissistic, or maybe that's largely what they are. They're confident, but in a way that's sort of grandiose and arrogant. And I think that's a really important distinction to make. So I like using the term self-confident, but I want to be clear about sort of saying, well, self-confidence to me is confidence in your hard work and achievements and productivity. It's authentic pride. It's not this grandiose sense of self. Sure. You talked about Eastern cultures, which is one of the reasons I actually showed up here. <laughs> I had an email that landed up. You know, I don't know, this is happenstance, this is up my, my inbox today, which says, I'll just read it to you. And this is from about 2300 BC. This is from one of the Vedas, which goes, education yields humility. Humility yields character. 
Character yields wealth. Wealth supports a righteous life, and righteousness yields happiness. Huh. And so a uh, central part of most Eastern cultures, at least the culture that I come from, is the sublimation of ego. And actually doing great work is meditation in itself. Yeah. So, for, so when I sat and listened to most of your lecture, it really didn't apply to me because I am on a path trying to actually sublimate my ego and get rid of any of the pride, whether it be the good or the bad pride. Yeah. And so do you think I have no chance in, the, in a Western culture to, to survive? No. <laughs> um, I think this is a really important issue. You know? and, and my thinking is... That view, which you know, I'm familiar with the Eastern, the Eastern view, as you say, supplement the ego. And as I said, Buddhism really is, is you know, big Eastern philosophy and, and religious view, depending on how you see it, that's all about avoiding pride. I think they're missing something. You know? and, and far be it for me, this is like thousands of years of, of knowledge. But I think that really what they want people to do is feel a sense of pride. Maybe they don't want to call it pride because pride, you, know, you think of pride and you think of the hubristic side. And clearly that's problematic and that's, that's not going to do all the things that you just said. Um, but authentic pride is just the desire to feel good about yourself. And so my view is you're becoming this kind of person. You're focusing on supplementing your ego and working hard and focusing on humility and doing all the things you just said, being righteous. The reason you're doing that is because you want to feel good about yourself. You have this sense of self, this identity that you're building up. And for you, one part of it that's really important is sublimating the ego, not being arrogant, being humble. But what I would say is that's, that's the desire to do that, the desire to build an identity that meets certain requirements that you've decided. That's, that's pride. Pride is what makes you want to feel good about yourself. It's just, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad pride. It's not arrogance. It is just authentic pride. And as humans, we evolved to have this sense of self that we care deeply about. And there's enormous adaptive advantages that we get from that, from having a sense of self and, and caring about our reputation and how we see ourselves and how others see us. And so, you know, pride is the emotion that tells us when we're en route to achieving that. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's, you know, wanting to feel pride in our sense of self is okay as long as we understand that we're not talking about arrogance, we're not talking about egotism, we're not talking about putting others down, and that a big part of what we can feel pride in is all the things that you say, being humble, caring about others, putting others' welfare before our own. Um, being the kind of person who does that is very much something to feel a sense of authentic pride in. Hi. So coming to the same thing like he said, like in our culture, I've seen taking pride in saying that you made this person proud, you made your parents proud, you made your country proud, and kind of get the pride from that happiness rather than saying, I mean, I did good for myself. I said, I did good. I'm happy because my parents are proud or my. Yeah. You know uh, what I mean? yeah. No, absolutely. So I think that's a great point. Um, that we can feel pride in our individual self. And I think in individualistic cultures, that's a lot of what we feel pride in. But in more collectivistic cultures, we are very focused on our larger sense of self. And we all have this. Even in individualistic cultures, our self is not just, you know, for, for every one of us, it's not just me, right? There's the self that you have if you have a child. There's, you know, the self in that relationship or in your partner or in your family or your larger community, right? You all probably feel proud as someone who works for Google, right? And you feel proud of the company. When the company does a good thing, even if you weren't directly responsible for it, you're gonna feel a sense of collective pride in that. And I think that's great. I think you know that's a really useful thing. It makes us care about those who are close to us. It makes us care about our communities. It makes us work hard for our larger groups. Um, and yeah, I do think it's a way of kind of dealing with this, this issue. And I think in collectivistic cultures, one of the goals is to sort of tamp down the individual and, and make people focus more on the collective self rather than the individual self. And that's how the society functions, is that my sense of self that's me as a member of this group, that's the most important sense of self that I have if I'm in a collectivistic culture. Whereas in individualistic cultures, my sense of self is much more me as an individual. Yes, I'm part of the group, but that's a less central focus. This is a broad generalization, of course. There's massive individual differences within both kinds of cultures, but I think that's what you're talking about. And so, yeah, if you're in a collective, if you're in a collectivist society, then absolutely, feeling a sense of pride in the collective can serve the same functions as, as feeling an individual sense of pride. Yeah. Hi. So um, you went to Burkina Faso to do um, a lot of research and gather a lot of evidence, um, and came up with uh, that how pride is universal and like even has an evolutionary um, aspect to it. What would be the next step in terms of things you want to research? <laughs> um, wow, OK. Well, so yeah, I think we, so the Burkina Faso stuff, I think, was, was um, that was fun. And, and I think it did actually lead to a lot of other research directions, some of which are in the book. So 
for example, um, you know, in Burkina Faso, we found that people recognize pride, but we wanted to know, do people show pride the same way in all cultures? So we did a study um, of the Olympics in which we looked at Olympic athletes from countries all over the world. And this is kind of a great opportunity to look at pride displays because you know, the Olympics is, a, is an occasion where people feel a ton of pride if they do well. And you have people from all different countries because it's the Olympics. Um, and we found that the same pride display is shown by people from countries all over the world. We found no cultural differences in, in displays of pride. So even people from collectivistic or Eastern cultures were just as likely to show pride as people from Western cultures. Um, there was no gender differences either. And then we did a study where we thought, okay, well, all these people, this is great, but these are all professional athletes. Unlike our Burkina Faso participants, they have plenty of exposure to other cultures. Maybe they're showing pride because that's our human nature, but maybe they're showing it because they've learned you know, when you win an Olympic medal and you're on TV, this is what you're supposed to do. So we were able to get, um, do another study of a sample of individuals who actually couldn't have learned to show pride from watching others. And that's because they were blind athletes participating in the Paralympic Games. And so we looked at these blind athletes, including a subsample of congenitally blind people. So people who in their lives had never seen anyone show pride. And when we did that, we found the exact same thing, that even these congenitally blind athletes who've never seen anyone display pride, when they win a match, and this was all judo athletes, when they win a judo match, they do that same thing. Expansive posture, head tilt up, uh, arms extended out from the body. Um, so that was kind of nice evidence, I think. And so when I say pride is universal, it's partly because of the Burkina Faso evidence, but it's also things like this, where we're seeing these displays in such a universal way. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, proceed to our book signing next. But first, please give a warm thank you to our author, Jeff Thank you. Thank you.